Good afternoon, everyone. Hope that, good afternoon. <laughs> you're still awake. There's, if you're not awake, there's coffee and tea at the back and uh, lemon bars not to be missed. So please get sugared and caffeinated as needed. Um, I know that many of you in the room have been participating over the last two days in this very exciting Violence Against Women in Elections workshop. And thanks for, for hanging in there and having the endurance to stick with us. Um, I really want to thank you all for being here and for participating in this important discussion. Uh, for those of, the, those of you that I haven't met, my name is Dabney Evans, and I'm the Interim Director of the Institute for Developing Nations here at Emory. So today, as I alluded to, uh, marks the end of the workshop on measuring violence against women in elections that IDN has organized in partnership with the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. IDN's mission is to convene scholars and practitioners in order to address global development issues facing the most marginalized and disadvantaged populations. And to that end, we have hosted a variety of workshops over the years in order to advance research and action in order to combat violence and poverty. And one of our most successful collaborations has been our annual workshop in partnership with the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. So we're really grateful for that collaboration and that partnership and our partners that are here today. We're also honored to host this workshop that brings together men, and there were a few men, they were commiserating at the bar last night, uh, feeling on the, on the periphery, as it were, not seated at the table over dinner. But uh, there were some men participants who were very glad to have, of course, as well as women from all over the world who are bound by the same passion, and that is the passion to end violence against women in elections. It's evident in every country, in every context, that violence, whether physical, verbal, psychological, sexual, or even systematic, is a persistent limitation to a nation's pursuit of free and fair elections and political processes. Even when the law allows a woman the right to vote, threats of violence do not allow the fulfillment of that right. This denial of a woman's full ability to participate in, political, um, in the political realm and take a role in the political process has a lasting impact on peace and security within states and globally. We know that when women participate in governance, there's an increase in laws and policies that better improve the quality of life of women, their families, and their entire communities. So, um, we know that the discussion that's been taking place over the past two days is working towards an even larger vision for global human rights. So this workshop has sought to address barriers to women's political participation, which will lead us to finding sustainable progress towards equitable forms of governance. Um, and, you know, we dream that, these, that women are able to fully and freely participate in elections and politics. And there are even larger implications of this discussion than what we can imagine today. And I think that we're all kind of acutely aware of how timely and important um, free and open democratic processes are, um, and particularly for people that are disenfranchised, as women may often be. So we're very fortunate to be able to open up this conversation today to the public here at Emory in order for those that weren't participating to get a little glimpse of that conversation um, and, and for our Emory community members to be able to engage in that conversation as well. So I'm pleased to turn the mic over to my colleague, David Carroll, who's director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center, who's going to moderate this program. Dr. Carroll leads the Carter Center's initiative on developing standards and best practices in international election observation. He's observed and participated in more than 70 Carter Center projects to strengthen democracy and electoral processes around the globe in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Dr. Carroll joined the Carter Center in 1991 as the Assistant Director of the Latin America and Caribbean Program and has directed the Center's Democracy Program since 2003. He received his PhD in International Relations from the University of South Carolina and has taught at the University of South Carolina, Georgia State University, and Suwannee, the University of the South. And we hope that someday soon, maybe he'll teach at Emory University. So um, please, David. Thank Dabney. Uh, and uh, for the Democracy Program and the Carter Center, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, 
uh, IDN, the uh, Institute for Developing Nations, for the great, great cooperation on, on this initiative, and also to the three panelists here who have been among the participants, and to many of the participants who are here in the room. We had about 30 people here for two days, and I think really good conversations about how to address the problem that Dabney uh, summarized quite well. I'm just going to go right into uh, the introductions. We'll hear from the panelists for about 15 or 20 minutes each. We'd like to save a, a half hour or so for questions that any of you in the audience might have. So with no further ado, we will start with um, Mona Lena Crook. Mona Lena is a professor of political science and chair of the Women in Politics PhD program at Rutgers University. She's published widely on gender quotas and women's political representation and global perspective, and also on violence and harassment against female politicians. Since 2005, she's collaborated with the National Democratic Institute on its Not the Cost campaign to stop violence against women in politics, and she was recently named an Ar Andrew Carnegie Fellow uh, 2017 through 2019 to research and write an academic book on this topic featuring testimonies from women around the world. So it's been great to have her as part of this group, and we look forward to hearing from Mona Lena. Thank you. Um, thanks so much uh, for, um, for coming uh, uh, to, um, to talk about, to learn about violence and harassment against uh, women in politics. Um, this is a topic that um, is really at the cutting edge, I think, of both academic research and uh, practitioner approaches to thinking about women's political engagement and empowerment. Um, so uh, in my presentation, I'm going to focus on what violence against women in politics is, why it matters, and what we can do about it. Um, so first, we start with the question, what is violence uh, and harassment against women in politics? Um, so I want to start with the definition given by the National Democratic Institute. I think this is um, pretty fairly, we could say, it's, it's a reigning definition um, being used uh, in at least practitioner work uh, around the world. Um, and they write that political violence can be experienced by anyone involved at any level of the political process. It affects and is directed at people of all genders around the world. However, the specific issue of violence against women in politics has three distinct characteristics. It targets women because of their gender. Uh, its very form can be gendered, and its impact is to discourage women in particular from being or becoming politically active. Um, if we think about this in, a, in another way, um, oh, I'm sorry, I think, oh yes, sorry. Uh, I just had, I doubted myself for a moment. So um, if we think about, just what's the distinction here that, that they're talking about? Um, political, scientists have, have long been interested in political violence. The reason why political violence is important is that, um, think about it as an attempt to defeat or silence a political perspective by force, right? So we can see why democratically that's very problematic, right? It's about interfering um, in, in the broader political uh, process, right? So we see, you know, work on terrorism, we see work on electoral violence, um, as well as, um, this is as so much recognized as a field, but um, a really important work on political harassment. Um, this is Alicia Doan's recent book that looks at um, harassment at abortion clinics, right, and, and harassment of people um, based on their abortion uh, policy uh, um, support. So we know that this is, this is problematic. Um, what makes violence against women in politics different from this is that this is about attempts to silence and exclude women specifically, right? So it is a type of political violence, but it's, it's really about making sure that women are not able to participate, that women's um, voices are not heard in the electoral process. Um, and this is something that has not been the focus of, of discussion uh, until recently, but clearly it also has those same types of political um, costs, right? Um, and so it can include um, uh, online violence, it can include uh, you know, allowing women to participate or not um, in, in uh, political deliberations. Um, so I think that how I want to approach this, this question is that we have this broad concept of violence against women in politics. Um, but we can think about this both in terms of force or threat of force, right, what people um, traditionally think about as violence. Um, as well as 
the creation of a hostile work environment. So we usually think about this as, as harassment. For me, the, the, it's both of those things that, that fall underneath the broad umbrella of, of this phenomenon. Um, but this is why I'm um, using violence and harassment also thinking about them as, as violence as, as the broader category. Okay, so if we think about this, what are the different forms it takes around the world? Um, well, first, um, obviously physical violence, right? I think this is the intuitive. We can recognize this as, as types of violence. Uh, could include murders, kidnappings, beatings. Um, an example I have here is of uh, a picture of Juana Quispe, who was a local counselor in Bolivia, um, who was subject to uh, various forms of harassment that es escalated um, over the years uh, until she was finally found murdered. Um, and her death uh, precipitated the passage of the first law in the world that criminalizes political violence and harassment against women. Um, sexual violence is the second type. Uh, it would involve things like rape, sexual harassment, um, sexualized threats. Um, and this is something that's really come to the fore uh, in the last few months in, in particular. Um, some cases we've seen um, in France in 2016. Um, and in Canada, really, since 2014, uh, they've been having a discussion about sexual um, harassment and sexual assault in, in politics. Uh, oh, okay, a third type is psychological violence, and um, that would involve things like threats, character assassination, stalking. Um, I think online abuse often falls in this, in this category. So there was a, a recent study by Amnesty International that looked at Twitter abuse against female members of parliament in the UK. Um, and they found that it affected women across all of the political parties, um, but it was particularly directed uh, at women of color uh, in the parliament. So almost half of all of the abusive tweets that were sent at British uh, member, female British members of parliament were directed at one woman, uh, Diane Abbott, who is the first black female member of, of parliament. Uh, fourth type is economic violence, so that would include things like property damage uh, or denial of salary or, uh, or office. Um, I think property damage is most commonly seen. Uh, the example I have here is a tweet showing uh, the window at Angela Eagle's office. She was contesting uh, the the leadership of the Labour Party uh, after the Brexit referendum in the UK, um, and a, a brick was thrown through her um, through her office window. Uh, she's also the first uh, open lesbian in the British Parliament, so she was subject to a lot of uh, homophobic uh, attacks and slurs as well. Um, the fifth type, and this is, is less recognized in practitioner work because it's something that is it's much more difficult to, to operationalize, um, but I do think it's very important to, to bring into our discussion. Um, and this is what I'm, I'm calling semiotic violence. So this is about sexualized images, about sexist language that's used against um, female uh, politicians. So, um, you know, we see that uh, very sexualized, even like very pornographic images are circulated, um, you know, doctored images circulated on, on Twitter, elsewhere um, in the internet. Um, we also see that um, there have been a lot of interesting debates in countries where you have male and female um, genders in the language. So across Latin America, it's been really interesting. Um, and in Brazil, it was a huge issue. The first female president, Dilma Rousseff, she called herself presidenta. She you know, feminized uh, the, the word. But her uh, conservative critics kept calling her presidente. Right, the idea that like, well, it's grammatically correct to call you know call her as if it was the male form, um, and it's it's quite interesting. It's it's also um, the Royal Spanish Academy uh, came to a decision that they th said to say male and female deputies is artificial and unnecessary distinction. Right, it's this idea that like. Well, it's kind of like reminding us that this is actually a very male space, right? And like this idea of bringing women into this space has raised some really interesting conflicts, right? So it's this whole range of, of different possibilities related to, to symbols and, and language. Um, and all of this is really about demeaning women, right? Uh, and and um, defending male domination, right? This is why I think it's a type of violence and, and harassment. Okay. Um, so we don't have that much data yet on this phenomenon, but of course this is why we've had this uh, discussion uh, these two days. Um, but the data we do have is very striking. In uh, 2016, the Interparliamentary Union uh, did a, a survey, did um, interviews with female members of parliament from all regions of the world. Uh, they were from governing and opposition parties. Uh, experienced women, newcomers, uh, women from ethnic minorities, et cetera. Um, and you know, stunningly, more than 80% of those women said they had experienced some form of psychological violence. Um, about uh, one-third had experienced uh, economic violence, 
one quarter uh, some form of physical violence and uh, one fifth one type some type of sexual violence in the course of their work of uh, as parliamentarians so it's not just in their lives but as MPs that they experience these types of, of violence so it's clearly something that's not uncommon right uh, it really speaks to the experiences of political women around the world um, so uh, I think this is also very uh, interesting in light of the fact that we're at a moment where we have unprecedented historic levels of female political representation around the world. Right? So in the last 20 years, we've seen a doubling of women's presence in national parliaments in every region. Right? And some, kind, um, some of the regions is actually you know, three times, four times as many women as we had in politics before. Right? And so the question is, is this a backlash to women's increased presence? Is it the fact there's just more women there? Or is the fact we're talking about women's representation is, is um, opening up these experiences that have always been there? Um, I think it sort of raises some questions, though, about whether or not we really are on the road to equality, right? Um, that there still is this important um, barrier there that's preventing women from being elected, but also making it difficult for them to be politically effective. OK, so my second question. are, are th are violence and harassment just the cost of doing politics? Um, you know, we could think about how, how we normally think about politics, right? Uh, politics is often seen as a, vol a violent place, right? Um, and that just being a public figure is something that comes with increased public exposure and, and vulnerability. Um, and I think this captures, this, is, this idea is really captured well by this uh, quote from uh, Winston Churchill where he says that politics is almost ex as exciting as war and quite as dangerous. In war, you can be only be killed once, but in politics, many times. Right? So this idea that it's just, it's just violence. So if women are entering these spaces, those are, it would make sense that those are the kinds of experience, uh, experiences that they're having. Um, we also know that people in general tend to hate politics, and by extension, politicians. <laughs> um, so this poll uh, that was taken in the United States, uh, it's taken periodically, asking people if they have a higher opinion of Congress, and comparison to a whole like list of un, uh, unpleasant things. Um, and there's, you know, root canals and uh, traffic jams, cockroaches are all, have, people have a higher opinion of those things than of uh, politicians, right? Um, for politicians are more, are viewed more favorably than the Kardashians and, uh, you know, gonorrhea. So maybe that's a good thing, but um, in general, right? So the idea is that, well, maybe people are just, you know, hostile to their elected representatives. This argument, though, I think is starting to change. And um, I think there's, what we're seeing is increased awareness that while the public has every right in the world to criticize uh, their elected representatives, their candidates, they should, right, for these democratic reasons, um, still there needs to be a line drawn when that kind of, um, you know, hostility goes into um, threats, intimidation, um, abuse. Um, and these are types of behaviors that have really expanded exponentially with the rise of social media over the last few years. Um, and the way that governments are responding is actually quite interesting. So um, the Swedish uh, government uh, put out a, an action plan uh, on uh, threats and hate uh, against journalists, uh, elected officials, and artists, and arguing that this is actually about protecting free speech, right? Addressing online trolling, be people will say, well, but trolls have the right to free speech. Well, it's actually, they do that in order to reduce the free speech of their targets, right? And it's like, who has the right to free speech here? So this is about protecting free speech. Um, and just uh, last year, the uh, UK uh, Prime Minister called on the Committee on Standards and Public Life to collect evidence on abuse and intimidation of candidates in the 2017 elections. Um, and they just produced their report at, at the end of uh, December. Um, so we're starting to think about that these are actually things that are challenging to democracy itself, right? Things that we just shouldn't accept as sort of coming with the territory of political engagement. Um, in terms of women, we're seeing uh, some growing evidence that targeting women for violence and harassment has had um, other democratic implications, um, particularly seeing evidence that is turning off a lot of young women from engaging uh, in politics or pursuing uh, politics as a career. Uh, we're also seeing that um, by targeting women uh, and minorities in politics, it's really restricting the ability of those groups to pursue policies that would uh, empower right uh, all members of, of society. Um, and you know, you have politicians like Diane Abbott writing these editorials, <laughs> talking about how this is having policy implications, right? It has a substantive representation uh, effect. 
Um, finally, we can also think about this as a human rights question, um, which of course means that it's violating everybody's, everybody's rights. And um, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright wrote a, a, an editorial on International Women's Day in 2016, uh, which she talked about, she, it was titled The Hidden Reality of Violence Against Women in Politics. Um, and she said that freedom is not possible in any society where women who speak out are brutalized, intimidated, or silenced. Okay, so what, what can we do, right? If you believe that this is a problem <laughs> and it's a bad problem, uh, I think there's quite a number of, I think, very promising uh, new lines uh, that are emerging. So um, if we look at this in terms of international organizations, a lot of international organizations are starting to talk about this. Um, one example is a resolution that was passed unanimously at the IPU's uh, uh, assembly in 2016. Um, and the resolution is called the, the Freedom of Women to Participate in Political Processes safely, Fully, Safely, and Without Interference. And um, these are the four articles that are incl uh, included there that talk about how um, calling on political leaders, calling on members of parliament, calling on parliamentary officials to take steps to, to tackle the problem of violence uh, and harassment directed at women. Um, in Latin America, we've seen uh, the passage, as I mentioned, of a law in Bolivia to uh, criminalize uh, political violence and harassment. Um, we've seen at least four other countries introduce similar legislation. Uh, Mexico, I think, is the case where that's gone the farthest. Usually, it's Several times now, it's been um, passed by one one house of parliament, and then there's you know, but not the other, and then there's elections, and then it's like the other house of parliament passes it, but not the other, and then there are elections. Um, so they've been working on that uh, quite a bit, but it's something that has really diffused, right? Thinking about legal measures that could be pursued um, in Mexico because they are, have had difficulties in the legal measures. Um, so different state actors have come together to create this protocol on addressing uh, vi political violence against uh, women. And this has meant bringing together um, the electoral uh, justice system with the State Institute on Women's Rights, uh, as well as uh, other, um, other, you know, the National Electoral Institute, um, to, to develop a protocol about how they could all work together um, to, uh, to make sure that this issue doesn't fall through, through the cracks. Um, some political parties are moving to address this as well. Liberal International, which is the international network of liberal parties around the world, uh, made a statement to the Human Rights Council um, um, to end violence against women in politics. Uh, there's also been some work, especially in Latin America, to think about um, how to, what political parties could, could and should be doing. Um, finally, uh, and I think most interestingly, there's a lot of work being done um, at the civil society level, um, and that includes, you know, networks of, of politicians and, and journalists coming, coming together. So the, the Not the Cost uh, campaign, the hashtag, um, that comes from the National Democratic Institute's uh, global campaign to stop violence against women in politics. And the argument that they're making is that this actually sh is Violence is not the cost of women's political participation. We shouldn't accept that, right? And so the hashtag, I think, has been very important for building global awareness of, uh, of violence against women in, in politics. Um, we're also seeing groups like Name It, Change It, which calls out uh, sexism, uh, sexist media coverage, um, a number of groups addressing sexual harassment. We Said Enough was uh, something that came out of um, work in the California state legislature, brought together legislators, staff members, lobbyists uh, to fight sexual harassment um, in uh, the California uh, state houses. Um, and really the point of all of this work is to, uh, in the words of this French manifesto, to really um, try to break the conspiracy of silence around, uh, around this issue. Um, and so I think that what we're seeing is a lot of movement uh, on, on this and people are in many different regions of the world. And I you know, use the French and British cases just to remind us that it's not just an issue uh, in, in developing country uh, context, but it's something that really is a global problem uh, with growing um, urgency to, to address. So thank you so much. Can you hear me? Um, so our next speaker is uh, Ellen Bjarngard. Ellen is a senior lecturer in development studies and also an associate professor in political science uh, at the Department of Government at Uppsala University in Sweden. Her research interests are within the field of comparative politics with a particular focus on gender, masculinities, violent conflict, 
political parties, and informal institutions. She's published in journals such as Comparative Politics, Government and Opposition, and the Journal of Peace Research. In 2013, she published a book entitled Gender, Informal Institutions, and Political Recruitment, Explaining Male Dominance in Parliamentary Representation. Evan. So I'm going uh, to narrow the focus a bit as compared to what Mona talked about. So Mona talked about violence against women in politics more broadly. I'm going to zoom in on elections and how gender can play a role uh, in elections and how we can rethink about how we look at, observe, and assess elections uh, with a gender lens on elections. And these are reflections that are based on a, a project that's very much uh, ongoing. Um, I have uh, conducted a pilot uh, study in the, in the Maldives within this project in collaboration with IFAS. I have conducted a, a study uh, in Myanmar uh, with a survey of candidates and also qualitative interviews with, with candidates, as well as a survey of election stakeholders more broadly in Myanmar. And I am going to, in a few weeks, go to Sri Lanka to collect uh, what I hope will be the, the, the biggest and most systematic survey uh, of candidates uh, in elections. Uh, so none of these projects are finished yet. It's a big project with many sub-projects, so these are really reflections from an ongoing analysis, what I think uh, we may be able to learn from this, from this project. Uh, a few words about the design of this uh, whole project. So the main focus is on candidates' experience. Uh, and I'm well aware that there are many, many other important stakeholders that we need to look at when we observe elections. But to kind of focus on one group that is clearly identifiable, that we know have a relation to the election, and that we can uh, identify and, and survey is, I think, a, a, a good way forward in an emerging field like this, where it's still very um, difficult to identify who exactly do we need to, to talk to and what are we basing our conclusions on. So at least with focusing on candidates, we know they are stakeholders in the election and, and violence and harassment that they experience during the election phase is not necessarily, but highly likely to be connected to, to the election. Uh, importantly, I'm focusing on both uh, elected and non-elected candidates. I do this uh, research after the election has taken place so that I can um, survey and discuss experiences that take place during the campaign phase as well as in the, during election day. Uh, I don't capture as much of the post-election phase, but the important thing is also if you want to capture candidates' experience, you need to, to capture them while they still identify as as, as candidates, and that's of course particularly true for the non-elected candidates who have actually experienced a defeat and who may not even want to talk about uh, their experiences. So if you try to approach them quite close to the election, there will still be organizations who have worked with them as, as candidates and they will still be able to be identifiable and to, to be able to reach out to. Um, my focus is very, very clearly gendered. Uh, and for that reason, I would say, I focus on both male and female uh, candidates. I, I do this for a number of reasons. First of all, to be able to compare uh, the experiences of male and female candidates, but also to see if there are experiences and types of, of violence that is gendered either male or female, and what kind of manifestations we might, we might see when it comes to gender aspects of violence. And as I said, pre-election phase and election day is, is what I focus on. Um, the, the kind of uh, theoretical um, starting point of this is coming from the field of election violence, but also trying to, to reassess the way that we look at election violence and why election violence matters. Because when we look at violence, I mean, it's always violence as a violation of personal integrity is always a problem. But when it's election violence, there's another aspect to it as well, and it's the fact that it actually violates electoral integrity as well. So it's both the electoral integrity and the personal integrity uh, that's at stake here. So it's this double uh, 
problem that I'm, that I'm interested in, when these two intersect. And whereas electoral violence is usually identified by its motive. So when you look at academic studies of election violence, you, you have the definition there that it's supposed to be an act of violence with the intention of changing the outcome of the election. So that's one important aspect here. That's what I'm looking at as well. But I'm also adding uh, a criteria about the means of violence. The means of violence here is about violating personal integrity. And when we look at violations of electoral and personal integrity rather than election violence, it becomes to me quite clear that we can't just focus on physical violence. There are many ways of violating a person's personal integrity, having the intention of affecting the outcome of an election that does not just include physical violence. So harassment, threats, uh, rumor spreading can also be a way of trying to affect the outcome of the election and it's certainly hurtful to uh, personal integrity. So if we try to, to look at it from that perspective, uh, we get a broader range uh, of activities and we also gain a more gender sensitive uh, approach to election violence. And so why then is a gender sensitive approach to election violence and to elections in general needed? Well, the, the present methods uh, mask a masculine gender bias, uh, which means that there's a way of underestimating the overall prevalence uh, of violence. If, there is, if we are focusing on physical incidents of violence, and that is a form of violence that mainly male candidates experience, we are going to not see, we're going to make invisible uh, a lot of the types of acts that actually do both uh, affect a person's uh, personal integrity as well as the electoral integrity. And of course, we also risk designing programs that are then involuntarily uh, designed to tackle male experiences of violence. Again, so the, the ways in which we work against this will not work with the broad range uh, of, of violent acts that, that take place. So gender, of course, matters in a multitude of ways uh, when it comes to, to uh, violence. And it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly when and where and how gender matters. Uh, and I think it's often empirically uh, almost impossible to do so. But at least analytically, it's important that we try to think about the ways in which violence, uh, in which gender plays a role uh, in, in the violence that we see. So together with Gabrielle, who's sitting here, and Jennifer Piscopo, uh, we have worked with an analytical uh, way of trying to think, well, first of all, is gender in the motive uh, of the violent act? If so, it's gender motivated. That's the type of violence that's conducted because one does not think that women should be in politics because it is a woman. So the kind of argument we have to, to make when we categorize an act uh, as being gender motivated is, well, would this same act of violence have happened to a male candidate uh, or would it not? But even if it's not gender motivated, it may be the fact that gender is in the form. So if, if we think, try to think from the point of view of a perpetrator, there is actually a cost-benefit analysis there. It's quite risky to go out and attack uh, a candidate physically. It's visible. You might be caught. You might be hurt. So if you can reach the same effect by attacking someone online, uh, claiming that this person has uh, a moral character that's not suited for politics by claiming that this person has had an affair uh, with someone, then that's perhaps a quite smart thing to do. If you reach the same, the same, um, if you can still destroy a, a person's career uh, by using a gendered form of violence that is going to be more efficient with female candidates as opposed to male candidates, that's a gendered form of violence. It's not motivated by the gender, but it's a strategy that's used for the gender. And even if it's none of those, gender can still be in the impact. So by seeing violence, women can, be, um, can, can think that politics is not a place for me. Even if, if a woman is attacked and, and it's not because gender wasn't the motive or in the form, it can still 
impact on, on other women. It can still be interpreted uh, in ways that are certainly very, very gendered. So this is not an easy thing to unpack, but it's also an important way, I think, of showing how gender matters in so many ways, so we really can't disregard it when we, when we look at, at uh, election violence. I'm just going to go through some very uh, e simple, in one way, uh, guiding questions about things that I think we should uh, think about when we assess uh, elections, and they're simple in the case that it's what, who, where, when, and how. So we need to think about what are we asking questions about, and how can we make that more gender sensitive? Who are we asking? Uh, where are we looking? When are we asking? And finally, how are we asking? So what are we asking? This goes back very much to, to uh, what Mona talked about. So different types of violence may affect men and women uh, differently. And uh, if we just ask in very general terms about, well, did you experience violence? Uh, we cannot be sure that we actually capture the full uh, range of experiences. Uh, violence means different things uh, in different contexts. Uh, and if we focus, as a lot of election violence literature has done, on seeing publicly visible incidents of violence, we will end up focusing on the physical violence. That's the first uh, category there. But if we are aware of the different types of violence that men and women are victims of in elections, but also more widely in the, in the, in, in the society at large, we know that physical violence is in physical public violence in particular is, is a very male experience of violence. Physical violence that women experience more often take place in the private sphere. But we also see that psychological violence is one of the uh, main types of violence that, that women face. We also have economic violence, and then I put sexual violence lower down, not because I, I don't think it's important, rather because I think it can uh, be seen as a category to, to all of the above. You can really think particularly about physical violence and psychological violence as both having sexual aspects that need to be, that need to be taken into account. Um, so, so just to show you a bit about how, how asking about different forms of violence may matter for how we assess elections. Uh, this is just some descriptive statistics from uh, the survey in, in Myanmar. And if we look at the physical violence, which is uh, normally what we would uh, assess, 28% uh, of election stakeholders, so this was a, a quite large number of election stakeholders, not just candidates, but a, a broader set of, of uh, stakeholders, both election commissioners, election observers, election officials, political party officials, candidates and um, civil society representatives. And they were asked to, uh, to what ex if they thought that these activities uh, occurred, if they perceived that these activities occurred during the election. And so 28% thought that physical violence uh, occurred. But if we then look at sexual violence, which is not always uh, mentioned there, if we look at the psychological forms of violence, we see that those are actually uh, far perceived to be far bigger problems. And that, that may be, again, as detrimental both to, to the, the victim itself, but certainly to the electoral process. So if we don't specifically ask for those forms of violence, we will miss out uh, on a lot of activities that, that take place and that are violating electoral integrity. Uh, we can also uh, disaggregate this data and see that some of these uh, are more relevant uh, to women than to men. Uh, in, in the ones that are colored uh, red here is where we have a significant difference between male and female respondents. Uh, so certainly when it comes to libel of sexual nature and threats, women were far more likely to experience, or, or the, the, I should say, the people surveyed perceived that women were, uh, were far more likely to, to experience this. When it comes to the illegitimate means by, by government, uh, it's kind of surprising to me, and here the, the difference is actually really big. 53% of women uh, said that they perceived that the government used illegitimate means, and 29% uh, of men said the same thing. Uh, 
The only reasonable explanation I've heard for this is that the former the government party, the military party, USDP, used a door-to-door -door campaign, whereas uh, NLD, the, the party that then went on to, to win the election, used big rallies. And so if we think again about the gendered structure, we can, it's likely that women are more at home. They are the ones that open the door. Again, this is not gender-motivated violence uh, in, in the sense that they were thinking, I don't think, of targeting and intimidating women, but the structures of society uh, made it so that the ones who were approached by the government party were, were actually uh, women. We can also see some differences if we look at disaggregate between uh, participants, politicians in the elections and those who were more observing uh, the elections. And politicians were more likely to, to have experienced libel and damage to property directly. Um, when, we, when we think about uh, this question about what we ask for, we also need to take into account the, the, the context and the fact that violence and harassment in many contexts become normalized to the extent that people do not even consider it to be violence or harassment when you, when you ask about it. Uh, in the survey in the Maldives, I had specific questions for all of these uh, different forms of violence, and yet uh, a woman, after having filled out the survey, she said she wanted to talk to me, and she said, well, I just wanted to let you know that I, I put no on all of those uh, questions because it's everyday things. It happens every day, so I didn't think it was worth noting down. So, so, so this, in the way that violence can become normalized to the extent that people don't see themselves as victims because it's what, what happens to everyone else, it's the cost of politics, right? Really makes it tricky for us as researchers to make sure that we capture uh, the, the violence and the harassment that does take place and that certainly affects uh, these candidates. There's not a question about that these activities affected her on a daily basis, but nevertheless, she didn't report them as something out of the ordinary which she thought I was asking for. So, so from, from that point on, I make a very you know, explicit, even if it happens every day, please, I'm interested in, in, in knowing about it, both in writing uh, on the survey and when I introduce the survey. Uh, moving on to who. Who should we, who should we ask uh, for information? Should we only focus on the victims? Uh, should we only focus on, on women, on women victims, maybe? Um, as I already said, my, my uh, strategy here has been to focus on a set of defined stakeholders in this, in this uh, project candidates to be able to say something about the prevalence uh, in that specified group, to be able to really ascertain that the people who say they, who do not report violence by themselves actually do not experience violence even by my standards and the way that I measure, measure violence. Uh, and also, I think uh, a lot of the violence that we see in mainstream uh, election violence is also gendered violence. It's, gen it's just gender to the masculine. Uh, and it's important to start naming men as men and to start naming masculine experiences, not as political experience, but actually as masculine uh, experiences. Um, some of the things you can see when you ge gender disaggregate uh, the data is that you can start to, start to actually see, well, what are the, the types of things that women experience more, more than men, or vice versa, which is not actually uh, the case in, in this, apart from uh, the fact of violence against others. So male candidates said that their supporters uh, experienced more violence than, than the female candidates did. Uh, but the, the, the very, uh, the, the, the kind of strong difference here is in libel of sexual nature again, where, where uh, a significant larger number of women uh, experienced uh, this than, than did men. So, so by doing this, we can see both that, yes, for instance, libel uh, and rumors is a very big problem, 77% of candidates. Uh, Libel of a sexual nature is a slightly smaller problem, but it, whereas libel rumor is a big problem for both men and women, libel of a sexual nature is a female problem to a large extent. So if we work with election campaigns, we need to work with libel and rumors for all candidates if we want to preserve 
uh, electoral integrity, but the sexual nature is a particular uh, gendered aspect that needs to be worked with in a somewhat more gender sensitive way. One, one difficulty of, of doing this is that in some cases we have very, very few women in politics. So in, in the Maldives, even getting women that would be enough to actually do any statistics on was really, really difficult. And I'm, I, I didn't really reach the target, so I, I really had to, to cluster the groups and, and try to think about, okay, I need to get all the women I can get and a comparable number uh, of, of men as well. Uh, so, so in the Maldives, 7.6% uh, of candidates were women, and there are five MPs in the parliament, and you see them uh, all in this, in this picture. Uh, some of the things that you, that you do find when you start uh, looking at the difference between, between men and women is really that, well, the images and the types of, of harassment that men, men and women meet are different and map on to different understandings of, of uh, masculinity and femininity. So again, in, in the study of Myanmar, you can see that many of the female candidates said that the rumors that were detrimental to their careers and to their campaigns and that they had online was about them having an affair or was about them being sexually promiscuous. When I asked the men about this, they mostly chuckled and say, no, that wouldn't hurt me and it didn't happen. Uh, uh, and they instead told stories about religious intolerance and how they would be accused of doing business with the Muslim community being terrorists uh, and, and instead tapping onto other inequalities and intolerances in, in uh, the Myanmar society that maps on to, to men. I will end by saying just a very few uh, short things about the, the remaining questions. Uh, if we want to do a gender sensitive analysis and think about the question of where, we need to move away from the geographical mapping that's really looking at the publicly visible uh, types of violence and also find ways to move into violence that takes place in private spheres. Several of my respondents told me how they were dependent on their husbands for, for being able to run a campaign and how their, their husbands divorced them when these rumors started to take place, uh, for instance. To internal party dynamics, I had uh, a respondent who received a rape threat by a colleague uh, in her party telling her that he would rape her on the floor of the house. Um, and to social media, of course. Social media is not geographically mapped, but it's a major, major site uh, for harassment, which Gabrielle will talk about more soon. When a lot of the violence that was reported uh, takes place in the pre-election phase. And so we can't focus on election day if we, need, if we want to understand what's going on. How? When we uh, do research about this, there are, as in any project, but perhaps specifically here, research, eth research ethics that we need to think about. What do survey questions do to respondents? Do we victimize them by telling them that they're victims? Can we secure the environment in which questions are asked so that it does not become obvious that they are reporting things that have happened to them. I think this is actually easier if you do both men and women because you can do it in party settings and you can do it as a, as a uh, part of trainings uh, that are taking place anywhere. You can raise awareness uh, of this as a problem but also potential victimization or re-traumatization. Uh, and cooperation with, with uh, an organization, in my case mostly IFAS really I think enhances the uh, accountability of, of this project. So that's, a, that's I think, is a, is a good aspect and the responsible use of the results because I'm conducting research that hopefully the organization will want to use uh, somehow. So this is then just a summary of what a gender sensitive approach to election violence uh, can do. Specifically ask about different forms of violence, encourage speaking up, ask both victims and non-victims, women and men, ask about non-public or semi-public arenas, ensure presence in the pre-election phase as well, and ask in a gender sensitive and secure manner and follow up if possible. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you so much, Alan. Our, our last speaker for the panel is Gabriel Bardal. Gabrielle is a senior gender specialist at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, also known as IFAS. 
She's also a research fellow with the University of Ottawa's Center for International Policy Studies. Her research has been in the field of violence against women in elections and digital forms of gendered political violence. She has advised and published on the issue of gender and violence for numerous international organizations, including UN Women, UNDP, IRI, International IDEA, and last but not least, most importantly, the Carter Center. <laughs> <coughs> and she has published in academic journals and the Ox uh, Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Politics and has worked in nearly 40 countries worldwide. So, Gabrielle, please. Thank you. Thank you, David, and the Carter Center and IDN for having us here today. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity to talk about a topic that um, is touching an innumerable amount of women worldwide and uh, is really impacting the quality of our democracies. So, as David said, I've now been working in this field for nearly 15 years of democracy assistance and elections, and it's been nearly 10 years talking about violence against women in elections. And I think the deeper we go into this topic, the deeper it becomes, and the layers keep peeling back and revealing both the complexity of it, the severity of it, and also new opportunities within it. And I'm here today to talk about yet another layer that we've, we've peeled back to, uh, which is, uh, political violence, electoral violence, gender, and cyberspace, uh, and information communication technologies, ICTs. So in the next few minutes, um, I'd like to talk about, first of all, why ICTs are important in this field and what is specific about them uh, that really needs to concern us where this topic of violence against women in politics is, um, what it looks like in the cybersphere, and that's another layer that we are continuing to peel, uh, and possibly, most importantly, what can we do about it? Um, so let's get started. Um, there are uh, several definitions of what violence uh, against women in politics and in elections looks like uh, in the field today. Um, my academic research looks at this both as a form of electoral violence and then as a very gender-specific, gender-based form of violence. So. I take my research from a point of departure that has a gender-sensitive definition of election violence. Political violence and the subset of electoral violence is a means of controlling or oppressing an individual's or group's right to participation in political processes and institutions through various forms of force, emotional, social, economic force, coercion, pressure, as well as physical and sexual harm. This takes place in different spaces. This is a definition that's based on the international definition of violence against women and, and gender, but we need to understand that it operates equally in the political and electoral sphere. Connected to that, uh, we see the existence of gender-motivated forms of political and electoral violence. This type of harm is a harm that violates either an individual or a group's political rights uh, on the basis of their gender identity. Uh, we talk about this specifically about women in particular because they are overwhelmingly uh, the most visible victims in the world today, uh, although we recognize that this uh, form of violence exists against other non-dominant uh, gender identities as well. So this topic of violence against women in elections and politics is a form of gender-motivated political violence that specifically targets women in order to enforce a patriarchal control of democratic institutions. So, talking about election violence and violence against women. Um, what do we know? We've talked about it already a bit. There are specific types of violence. It's physical, it's sexual, it's psychological, it's economic. There are specific victims as well. These include political actors, uh, obvious candidates, you know, political parties, people engaged in, in political involvement in that way. Institutional actors as well, security forces, police forces are really prominent up there among uh, who's perpetrating this type of issue. Uh, professional and non-states and non-political groups. Uh, these are all types from journalists to, to others, as well as private and non-political groups. These are, sorry, I'm talking victims, but uh, likewise for perpetrators. Uh, so I'll hit perpetrators. Um, the perpetrators likewise uh, are similar, but they're equally diverse in that regard as well. We know that this election takes, or this violence takes place during the pre-election period, the post-election, uh, as well as on election day itself. Um, and most importantly, perhaps, for the conversation today is where it takes place. Uh, it takes place in private locations, it takes place in public locations, in the domestic space, which can kind of bridge those. But most importantly for us, it takes place in a cyber location. 
So let's talk really specifically about what it is about information communication technology, about cyberspace, uh, that makes it really uniquely toxic uh, for women's political participation. It makes it an enabling space for violence against women in elections and politics. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the volume of attacks, the severity of these attacks. You know, hitting like on an obnoxious Facebook post or retweeting something, these are tiny things. People don't think about them. They chuckle a little bit and move on with their day. But on the receiving end, we're seeing victims of this violence that are receiving hundreds of death threats, of rape threats per hour uh, in some of these cases. This is overwhelming. It is about the volume of these incidents that's coming in that makes them so damaging and distressing. So we're looking at something that is not just individually incident-based, that's not linked to a specific perpetrator, but that is pervasive, that is consuming, that's terrifying for its victim uh, because of the nature of it, who, who to turn to, there, who, to, who to ask for help, who to prosecute in this, because it can be thousands and thousands of perpetrators uh, in this case. We also see that women can be exceptionally vulnerable to this type of attack for a number of reasons. Uh, there's a technology gap, especially in many of the countries where, where I'm working with IFAS today, uh, where internet penetration is limited, uh, it's often limited especially uh, to elites, to urban areas, to this and that, so there's divides in these spaces. And women may have uh, less access to it, less resources to invest in sufficient security structures, uh, less familiarity with how to become secure in cyberspaces uh, and, and otherwise. So there's a technology gap that exists uh, in, in especially countries that are coming out of civil wars and are going through transitions. Uh, there's also the question of the importance of morality and ethical concerns for women. And as much as we'd like to pretend that we are in an equal society and that these attacks you know, hit men and women all the same, the impact just isn't. Uh, again, especially in these transitional democracies, uh, women's traditional roles as the moral guardians, as the moral role models for their children, uh, as the protectors of the family in that sense, uh, are really strong, and their vulnerability to being attacked on those bases is just different from what men experience. And it's as Ellen said, um, when a man is attacked for having an affair, for having misbehaved sexually or otherwise, uh, up till now at least, uh, the impacts of that have been relatively limited. Um, for women, however, being attacked either, uh, you know, for sexual misbehavior, misconduct, or for uh, a deviant uh, sexual identity, uh, which is really common, um, you know, can really have devastating impacts as well. Uh, the importance of psychological and non-physical attacks on women. This has been mentioned by all of my colleagues. Uh, my research shows it as well. Women are experiencing up to three times as much psychological, non-physical intimidation and threats. Uh, and by nature, anything that's happening in the online spaces is non-physical. Uh, and so we know that that's the form of violence that impacts women, and that's where this is going on. Um, the pervasiveness of images. I was in Tunisia at one point talking to women parliamentarians, and they were saying, I can barely listen to what's going on on the floor of parliament. I, I kind of rush in and out because these guys are out there taking photos right and left, and then they manipulate them online, and they turn them into pornographic images, or they ridicule this, or if my hair is out, or if my ankle is showing too much or something, you know. Um, and they just, these images uh, are so powerful and women are being judged on them uh, in ways that men just simply are not. Uh, so they can be real images that are used to, to mock or especially photoshopped images. Uh, the speed of this, you know, you can have thousands and thousands of hits on an image uh, before any type of action can be taken, if any type of action can be taken, and the damage is done. We have to remember that within the electoral sphere in particular, the, we're working against the clock and you know, your, your reputation can be gone in a, in a heartbeat and maybe you won that case down the line six months or six years from now, but you've definitely lost the election and you might have destroyed your political career. So these attacks happen really fast and they're really damaging and we don't have much we can do about it. Um, the question of impunity, the question of regulation is total wild west. Um, during our talks over the past few days, we started mentioning different types of violence and I'll talk about it in a moment. We don't even know what they, we don't know how to spell them, let alone know what they mean or how to regulate against them and make them illegal crimes uh, because of the way that they're attacking women in particular. Uh, so this is really just a field of impunity. 
Uh, and likewise, kind of the inverse, not only elevating these negative and aggressive, abusive images of women, but also the ability of the internet to silence women. Um, this works in opposite ways as well, and we, we really need to be aware of that. So what does violence against women in cyberspace look like? <laughs> and what kinds of data can be collected regarding this type of violence in, in online spaces? So we've talked about the kind of traditional typology that we've been working with now since 2011, uh, physical harms, non-physical harms, bodily harm, et cetera. Um, those things are happening in the physical sphere, in the in real life sphere, but they happen uh, in cyber sphere as well. And we can kind of begin to classify the existence of different types of acts in that framework. Uh, so for example, in terms of bodily harm, well, for all of these, I'll step back, threats relating to any of these four categories that happen in the online sphere can be easily connected to that typology. But some of them are crossing the lines as well. So for bodily harm, for example, um, the case of, uh, proposing threats online, encouraging other people to attack the person in real life, we can cross out of the cybersphere and into the home. I, it's called doxing, uh, I guess, the, where you're giving out private information about the person's physical home address or their other identity and encouraging people to come and, uh, uh, and bother them or harm them physically. Um, clearly, the amount of sexual information going on in the websites is, is outrageous. The political porn... Uh, you know, the, the stalking, uh, all of these different things. I had the, um, the I won't say the pleasure, it was a, the strange uh, circumstance a few years ago to be talking about this issue. Um, and I didn't have to do screenshots or anything of examples. We just pulled up Twitter and typed in Hillary Clinton, it was during the campaign, uh, and expletive, uh, and just watched them roll in. Um, you know, the types, the sexual nature of these things, uh, is, is extraordinary, is extraordinary is all I have to say. Um, so, you know, all of these things do begin to appear um, across the categories that we've already identified in the more traditional areas, physical, I can't use physical because it's a category, but the in real life categories uh, also are happening online. Um, but as I said, you know, there's all of these other internet specific types of harm that we're only just beginning to recognize today. So we're just starting to work with this, um, but all of these different types of online specific behaviors that we're still trying to classify according to these four main fields, um, but they all appear. We have everything from Google bombing, flaming, doxing, defamation, cross-platform harassment. I don't even ask me to explain all of these now because I'm still learning also. Um, you know, complex forms of either intimidation, sexual demeaning, defamation, physical attacks, that are occurring in ways that we've never even considered before. Uh, and this is something that we need to, to grow with. So what can we do about it? Um, a lot, actually, and we're finding out more every day. Um, first of all, we need to track it. We need to try to record it. Um, IFAS, in partnership with NDI, is working on initiatives in this area. We're working with what we call sentiment analysis, uh, which, if you're not familiar with it, is a software tool, essentially, that gauges opinion uh, by going through social media and understanding users' perceptions um, of various subjects. In this case, it'll be men and women engaged in political life in various areas uh, to understand the presence of aggression, abusive behaviors, and other types of harms, um, and more, of course. Um, there are ways that we can respond to it. Um, that includes various legal protections. Um, as I said, we need to start defining and understanding what these specific types of harms are and then legislating on them. Uh, found out the um, catfishing, I guess, if you know what that is. Uh, there is uh, the first and only catfishing law, apparently, is in Oklahoma, uh, a leader. Uh, and, you know, this type of legislation is waking up to these new realities uh, and legislating on them, and that can become models elsewhere. Uh, laws about data preservation uh, as well. Um, working with the regulatory online environment and working with the platforms themselves that are hosting these, these spaces where this violence is occurring. Um, we can work on preparedness and security for the women uh, in particular that are most vulnerable to these things. Uh, we can work on resiliency as well. Uh, because as I said, um, so much of this is happening so quickly um, and in a political electoral time frame that we need to, to respond and to move on in many cases. And there are 
an amazing wealth of uh, sources happening in this field worldwide today. One of them we heard about um, in the past few days, HeartMap, uh, which is allowing women to talk about the online harassment they experience and then relate to a community uh, that can provide support, encouragement, uh, that they need to just power through and keep going, which is, um, which is a really helpful thing. Um, we can denounce it and we can promote sensitization campaigns and also work with groups that are most susceptible and also most influential with many of the perpetrators in this field to stop it. So that includes um, codes of conduct for political parties, codes of conduct for election management bodies and things like this uh, to regulate behavior and to change the norms around this type of thing. Um, and my last point is um, we as researchers need to adapt our methods to this um, because it doesn't look like uh, what we've done in the past. Um, when I started out uh, with IFAS, we were doing election violence monitoring and you would train 500 people to spend eight months in the field monitoring with paper and you know collecting these things and carrying them across the country. And it's, this is not that day anymore. Um, that wasn't that long ago, um, really not long ago. So um, we need to adapt really quickly, uh, not only the physical tools that we're using to collect and analyze this information, but also the theoretical and conceptual frameworks that we're using to, to study it. Um, so I will stop there and um, bring it to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. So we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, before I turn it to the audience, I just wanted to quickly say that, um, so the, the meeting that we had the last two days, there was about 30 uh, people participating. A number of them are, are in the audience here with us. It was, a, I think, a relatively unique gathering, probably not the first, but maybe relatively unique in that we had uh, both groups that work as international observers, citizen domestic observers, uh, academics, election assistance providers, think tank experts around the table to talk about this very specific issue and to say what can we do about this with a particular focus on what can we do to get more data and to try to help use that data in ways to address the problem. A couple of things that uh, we, I think, are you know, outcomes from this meeting. At a, at a very high level, we've made a commitment to raise awareness that violence against women in elections is part of electoral integrity. This, is a, this has to be understood as an issue of electoral integrity. Uh, we need to gather more data on all of these aspects of this problem. But importantly, we need to make much better use of the data that we're already gathering and have in our different institutions and spheres and related to that, better analysis of that data and better action-oriented recommendations, because we have a lot of this data, we need to make better use of it. And then looking forward, we've agreed that we're going to try to collaborate going forward and maintain some kind of a network to see what we need to do as this group, informal right now, to try to continue to, to raise awareness and, and hopefully try to address this problem. So please, um, Questions to any of the panelists. I, I know the, these are some of the foremost experts on this particular problem uh, in the world at this point, and I'd love to hear questions that you might have to any of them. I'm sure they would be happy to respond. Yes. Should I respond right away? I, th I think so. Go ahead, yeah. and then after that, we'll see if there's a cluster of questions. Yeah, yeah thank you. I mean, getting to the, getting to the uh, reason for perpetration uh, and it's, it's really, and the motive behind the act is really important, but also really, really difficult. Uh, so yes, I do, have, I do have data on who they think um, perpetrated. Uh, I also tried to ask about if they had perpetrated any of the above uh, themselves. Unsurprisingly, very few claim they had. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm reluctant to kind of do much uh, about it because it's, I think it's very different in different types of violence. I mean, the certainty with which you actually know uh, 
uh, who perpetrated uh, the violence. So, so if we look at, at social media, if we look at gang mobs, in the Maldives there were a lot of gangs who people said they knew who were behind, and it wasn't really the people perpetrating the violence who was the kind of brain behind that deed. So it's really, I mean, even if you ask for it, and even if you ask about who they think it is, I think it's, it's difficult to, to do anything about. But I have, I, I, I will look more into it as well, and we continue to, to ask about, and I hope in a better way in, in Sri Lanka, where we have uh, more systematically a question about uh, who you think perpetrated each act, and I hope more relevant categories, because that's also uh, the tricky part of actually getting the relevant categories of perpetrators in, in different contexts. More questions from the audience? Uh, thank you. My name is John uh, Wamwara. I'm Kenyan, uh, studying at uh, Emory Law School. Uh, um, my question is, is uh, and, and to any, any, any member of the panel, is politics inevitably violent? Uh, and, and if uh, there are good examples of uh, certain good examples, uh, good, uh, good practices that others can learn from different parts of the world as well. That also you could highlight so that we, we could read or study more, look up to them as well. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear it. What did you I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, is politics inevitably violent? And if there are good, I mean, no, I, I think especially democratic politics is, is actually a, supposed to be a way of solving conflicts without resorting to violence. So, so I, I think certainly not, it shouldn't be, and we can't accept that uh, as a standard. But I, I, I think it's, on the other hand, uh, certainly an arena where we're likely to often see violence of different forms. And because it is about, about power, about winning elections, about defeating, in, in some way, your opponents, it's also easy to reinvent uh, kind of new ways uh, to, to win, and I think social, the social media aspect is exactly what we're, what we're seeing there, that it's a, it's a, it's a new way of, of being able to defame your opponent or kind of get a, a shortcut to, to a result that you would like to see. But, but I, I, I certainly uh, don't think that politics is inevitably uh, violent, and I think there are a number of uh, political spheres that that are not, uh, I mean, it's, it's society, so there will always be problems of inequalities and structural violence and, and individuals that are, are violent, but it's, um, we, need to, we need to work uh, against that. So it, yeah. I think it is interesting, um, you know, I, there have been high, you know, um, high profile, uh, you know, political assassinations, for example, in, um, you know, in the UK, for example, a couple of years ago, Joe Cox, female member of parliament, um, or, you know, Anna Lind, the, the Swedish defense minister uh, in 2003. And, you know, so, and what's interesting is people's reactions to that is almost like, it's, it's like almost more shocking, right, in these sort of very, very established democracies. And it, it is happening, but it, I think the example, because it's so rare, right, that um, that's, I think, part of the reasons why it, it has uh, greater shock value. Um, but there, there does um, seem to be something also about this political moment that's really, um, I, th I think, you know, a lot of political polarization in a lot of countries, um, and um, you know, uh, there's a lot at stake, right, in politics. People get, you know, angry and upset, and you know, um, I, I think that's true. But um, you know, we, I think there's a broad acceptance that the violence is bad, right? So I think that. The goal is to to try to you know spread awareness that is, isn't something that should just be accepted and, and explained away, right? And I think that's sort of part of this this work is trying to to do that. Uh, no, I would say you know politics is the contest for power, which is an inherent contest. <laughs> Conflict. Uh, and democracy is the institutionalizing of a peaceful transition and competition for power. So the more we move towards democracy, um, the more peaceful transitions of power that we're, we're, we're hoping to have. Um, we also need to recognize that violence is constantly changing in nature. Um, 
in parallel to that democratic contest. I think what we're seeing with women in politics today and violence against women in politics in many ways reflects what we're seeing kind of in the broader conversation about democracy and elections globally. We're seeing a question of delegitimization of political, can of political actors, of political institutions, which is particularly worrying, uh, and uh, a lack of public confidence in, in democracy worldwide. We're attacking the image and the perception uh, of, of these, these bodies that allow us to have a peaceful transition of power. And that's what we're seeing with women as well. Um, there's certainly many physical forms of violence that women are experiencing, but one of the reasons that cyber violence is so persuasive is because it's attacking that image, that perception, that confidence in women. Um, and so all of these things are, are interconnected and they're happening in parallel. You, you, the last part of your question was about, you know, where can we look for examples? I would say, you know, start with Kenya, among other places. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, Kenyans, in the face of, of the terrible violence, which I was there to witness, uh, launched uh, Ushahidi, right? The, the program that was allowing crowdsourcing of violence to recognize where things were happening, when, why, how. Uh, and that was revolutionary and it has been worldwide now, not only for election violence but elsewhere. And it's enabled us to understand the nature of violence and to address it more effectively and it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, and so solutions are everywhere. Solutions are, um, you know, where, where, where there's need, uh, we, we find ways also. And I think that that type of innovation is, um, is where we should be looking. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Saskia, and then we have another question here. Go ahead, please, Saskia. Yeah, my question relates directly to what you just said. I'm curious because in the literature on just election violence in general, there have been attempts to look at subnational variation, right, to try and understand what are some of the root causes, why is it worse in some regions than in others. I'm wondering if there's, in your studies or in other studies on this issue, whether you've seen attempts to look at kind of subnational variation in violence against women in politics as well, or whether that's just impossible at this point given the data we have. Well, I don't know with your survey whether you were able to see some of those patterns and whether you think that might be an avenue of understanding also some of the root causes or potential solutions. Uh, let's get another question and, and was there one over here too? Yeah, okay, let's get all three of them maybe. I'm, I'm. Yeah, um, here's, so a, here's a microphone. Um, yes, uh, I'm not sure if the, this might be um, uh, very clearly answerable, but it sort of builds on, on, on the question of the perpetrators. I'm thinking of um, what could be some potential strategies and solutions for closed authoritarian context. So the example that I'm thinking of is that in 2016, 18 women were elected to the Iranian parliament, um, but it ended up being 17 women because one of them, after the elections, uh, the state, basically, the, the higher authorities of the state declared her candidacy illegal and therefore she could no longer and there was no way of contesting it there was you know it was for, for the general public it was quite obvious what was going on but um but in that so i'm just wondering you know places where election observers and all that is closed off like that. okay and then the third and then we can if the panel respond as they would like um, I had a question that was a bit specific to Ellen's study, but may be applicable to the others as well. And it was if you saw a systematic difference in the experiences of successful female candidates and male candidates and the non-successful, because I could imagine on one hand perhaps more viable candidates are seen as a bigger threat and therefore they receive more of this violence, or the women who were not successful are maybe more willing to speak about the violence because it's no longer potentially going to damage their political career if they've left politics. Should we start with that one, Ellen, uh, on yeah. that particular one? And then you can respond to the other questions as well and then go through the panel. Great. Uh, yes, so uh, I have uh, looked at successful and unsuccessful candidates. Uh, uh, and it, at least in the Maldives case, it's quite clear that it, there's no gender difference, but there's a strong difference between uh, people who have experienced violence of any form uh, are, are more unsuccessful. So they do, they do not win. So it's actually, I mean, it's working. And it's working regardless from the point of view of the perpetrator, of course. <laughs> it's working. Uh, it, so they are less likely to actually win regardless of whether it's psychological violence taking place uh, online or physical uh, attacks. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I haven't looked at the gender aspect, or actually there are too few people in each category. And that, that's actually the, the problem for the sub-regional. I do have a quite big regional um, spread, and I will have, I look at the local elections in Sri Lanka, so there I'll, I'll have a 
large regional spread, but there will be very few people since I'm looking at candidates uh, from, from every region. So the question is to what extent you can actually actually say something about regional variation. I think in, in election violence studies that, that would look more broadly at incidences or voter experiences or uh, that would be more possible uh, way forward to actually look at, at uh, regional differences with uncertainty. Anything on the, uh, the closed authoritarian societies question? Um, let's see, remind me again, what was, no. yeah. Uh, and your question was? So when you have the perpetrators of the violence against women, um, these sort of state institutions. Oh, right, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so, so that's another question that, that actually came up as part of the, of the pilot that I didn't originally include in the survey. But several of the people told me you have to include the state, government repression. That is something that is very important. My dad lost his job or you know, all kinds of things that, that happen. So that is something that we are now incorporating and that I think uh, is also part, it's also part of another project that I have on electoral authoritarian uh, settings where we're going to look uh, much more closely at that. So, so I, I don't have any results on that yet, but I, it's, a, it's a very important question that I will uh, look more into. Yeah, um, the question about subnational politics, I think, is, is really important. Um, uh, the, the Bolivian legislation, interestingly, um, was a result of mobilization by locally elected women um, who were experiencing uh, violence and harassment. And um, they started to, you know, c connect to each other and they started to realize it wasn't just them, right? Um, and it was largely women from the rural areas, women in indigenous communities that really experiencing the violence. So I think that that really, I think, was the impetus or the, the origin of, of the discussion across a lot of Latin America. Um, but even in Sweden, um, the government action plan I, I talked about actually, that light was thrown on the issue of violence against politicians. Um, by the local, uh, local and provincially, uh, you know, elected uh, uh, officials, and so I, I think that there is, this hu you know, whole uh, area of um, research that 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 could be done. Um, and I, I had done some interviews in Sweden a few months ago, and. The argument was that, well, you know, parliamentarians, there's a whole parliamentary, you know, security apparatus. For people at local level, what makes us so vulnerable is that, you know, there's not a lot of security, right, um, at, into the, uh, you know, the various uh, town, town uh, halls. But also, especially in small communities, people know where you live. They know where your child goes to school, right? Like, it's the religious centers where they're posting, you know, defamatory images and things like this. And there's, there's a high cost, right, to being socially ostracized, right, uh, and targeted in those, those types of communities. So I think there's a lot of, um, I think a lot of evidence that, that things are happening there. There's a lot of work that we could, we could do. Um, on, on the close authoritarian regime's question, I think, um, you know, uh, in case of Iran, but even, you know, um, uh, Rwanda, I think the presidential candidate, um, a woman had, uh, you know, was subject to a lot of mistreatment um, that prevented her from, you know, waging her campaign. Um, and I, the way that I, I think about this is that I think there's a shared problem of violence against women in politics across all countries, but the actual manifestations of repertoire is different depending on the tools that we have. Um, so, you know, like the moral and ethical dimension, right? Like that, that becomes really important in these like small, you know, very religious, uh, you know, communities and societies um, when you think, you know, compare what would happen in Iran versus what happens in Australia, right? There's still misogyny and sexism driving this, but, you know, Australia, it might be online, you know, media-centered attacks where in places like Iran, right, it's, it's very much state-sponsored. Uh, types of, of attacks, right? So it's kind of thinking about how we map out all the different ways that this can uh, play itself out. It's really, it's all the same phenomenon, right? But there's different tools. But also think about impunity, right? And a lot of times in Mexico, right? People who commit crimes, there's I mean, large-scale impunity for, for crimes. Whereas like in Sweden, it would be much harder, right? For people to get away with that, right? So I think that there's a lot of the, you know, opportunity um, that, that creates opportunities and constraints, right? On, on perpetrating this kind of of violence. Um, and finally, just on the, the successful versus non-successful, um, I actually think that the dynamic goes both ways. Uh, and I can't remember now, uh, if I were to pull up my computer, I would get it, but um, there was one country where like over 80% of the candidates dropped out during the course of the election 
because of violence, right? And so they're kind of out of, you know, they never had a chance to succeed, right? Like so, or they, there was, they never made, reached the final contest. But if, on the other hand, what we're seeing is that more prominent, women who are, are figure more prominently, right? So women in leadership positions, women who've uh, been featured in the media, that's when the attacks really happen, right? So I think it's like the super successful and visible, but also the people who've fallen out are, are really kind of the two sides of that, that issue. Um, so regarding subnational, um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, IFIS's data uh, on election violence is all disaggregated by, you know, it's, it's geotagged. Um, most emerging and well-established groups uh, are, you know, geotagged their data as well. They're integrating gender issues, so there's that. Um, when we did the cross-national comparison, um, in order to just have a sense of things, we categorized victims. Um, uh, as rural or urban centers, that type of thing, and we did find some some results from that. Women in rural locations came up much more frequently as victims, but that said, um, I wouldn't trust all of this data too, too far yet. I don't think it's refined enough uh, for a couple of reasons. We didn't know enough about violence against women in elections when it was conducted. Um, what we know now shows us that the types of violence that women are experiencing aren't collected by these types of processes, uh, and also, election violence is a, is a wily beast. And they, certain data collection methods will only work within a certain intensity of election violence. If the level of election violence or the nature of it is too low, the tool won't pick it up. And if it's too high, it'll, it'll explode a data collection system. So really hard. Um, but it's basically out there. That said, um, I think there are other um, cross variables that we really do need to be looking at this. Um, the geographic distribution, subnational is certainly one. Um, intersectional identities, uh, again, we need to be looking at women with disabilities, women of racial, ethnic, religious minorities and different groups like this. We need to understand how these multiple identities are impacting this field. Um, and I would include very importantly in that uh, elite women versus not. Um, and also opposition women versus incumbent mm -hmm. party women. And I've written on this in the past, um, but there's a, there's a significant divide in that as well. Um, incumbent parties in authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes tend to be really good at having women in politics mm. uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, so, and not good reasons. So um, we need to be conscious of these things. We need to be investigating them, analyzing them very carefully uh, and critically, and um, you know, looking at these things from, from cross perspectives. On the question of closed authoritarian regimes, uh, I mean, there's no justice for anyone, right? Uh, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Um, but um, human rights organizations and others are very active in these countries, either in the countries or working as diaspora or, or um, in exile, uh, using social media, using the internet. Uh, and we've seen these campaigns really um, proliferate uh, in different places. I mean, IT-based systems are being used in Syria, for example, to understand what the nature of the violence is going on there uh, and to report on it and to give transparency and voice to those people that are subject to it. Um, so there's, there's that. And having the information is at least the first step towards justice. Um, but I would also end on a note of caution. Um, you know, working with closed authoritarian regimes, um, especially using um, technology-based messaging, um, whether that is, you know, sophisticated internet-based things or whether it is, uh, you know, more classic things like, I don't know, throwing pamphlets or, or USB sticks into, into North Korea or something like that. Um, those have gendered impacts as well um, that we need to be aware of. So the North Korean case is a case in point. Democracy activists have long, long, long been trying to get democratic messages, what is life like in, in democracies into North Korea, which ostensibly you know, is opening people's eyes to what that could be like, um, a positive thing. Um, but 85% of defectors out of North Korea are women. Uh, many of them are motivated by these image of, images of democracy in the Western world. Uh, and if they're defecting based on that idea, they're going into China where they're almost immediately brought into sexual slavery and human trafficking situations. So we need to be aware of the gendered impacts uh, of using new technologies um, to promote participation, awareness, democratic values as well. So um, we are over time. So I'd, I'd like to thank the panelists. But also, I think if any of you didn't get a chance to ask a question that you'd like to uh, 
to ask to them. Maybe afterwards, if uh, they're available, I'm sure if, if they can spare the time, they would be happy to, to respond to you. But can we give them a hand and say thank you all for your interest? <laughs>